Hi, this is Siavish. Two years ago, we made a video called Who Controlled Jerusalem the Longest, in which we went through the entire timeline of that city's history, noting that it has been besieged 23 times, attacked 52 times, and captured or recaptured 44 times, making Jerusalem the most fought over city in all of world history. Well, if there's any city that can come close to rivaling Jerusalem for that top spot, it's Constantinople, or as it is known now, Istanbul. Whereas Jerusalem has been besieged only 23 times, Constantinople has actually been besieged 36 times. So today we're going to take a look at the timeline of this other great city, which has been known by many nicknames such as the Queen of Cities, the City of Wonders, and the Jewel on the Bosphorus. And by the end, we'll have an answer to the question, who controlled Constantinople the longest? The city of Byzantium, or as it's known by its Latin version, Byzantium, was likely founded around the 8th or 7th century BCE by settlers from the city of Megara in what is today Greece. The date often given is 667 BCE, but that's not a certain date. Let's begin in the 7th century BCE nonetheless. Its legendary, if not mythical, origins tell the story of a man named Byzas and his wife, Phidalea. Byzas had founded the city, possibly with another person named Antes, and Phidalea had helped defend it against the Scythians soon after its founding. It wasn't a major city for a long time and was only a stop on the road between northwestern Anatolia, Macedonia, and Greece. Let's name this period the Greek era. It remained an independent city-state for two or three centuries before it was conquered by the Persian Achaemenid Emperor Darius the Great in 512 BCE. The Persians ruled for around 34 years before they were expelled by the Greeks in 478 BCE. In the larger struggle between Athens and Sparta in the 5th century BCE, known as the Peloponnesian War, Byzantium supported Sparta and kept its independence. Similarly, when the Romans came knocking, Byzantium signed a treaty with them in 150 BCE that gave them autonomy in exchange for tribute. It formally became a part of the Roman Empire in 46 CE, when the Roman Empire officially annexed the region known as Thrace. So altogether, the Greek era lasted around 7 centuries. For simplicity's sake, let's say it was exactly 679 years if we assume the founding date of 667 BCE. During the Roman period, it wasn't yet a great city, but it did become regionally important. Unfortunately, it was besieged and largely destroyed during the year of the five emperors when the Roman Empire was plunged into a civil war. Byzantium sided against Septimius Severus, who then attacked it in 196 CE. After destroying it, Severus actually had it rebuilt and renamed it as Augusta Antonina in the honor of his son and heir Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, also known as Caracalla. During this reconstruction, Severus added public baths and the city's first hippodrome. He also fortified the city with a new wall, which is known as the Severan Wall, although this is disputed by scholars. Fast forward to 324 CE when an emperor named Constantine came around. By this point, the Roman Empire had been divided into two halves, each ruled by two emperors, one senior known as Augustus and one junior known as Caesar. Constantine was a military general who was also the son of Constantius, the man who ruled the Western Roman Empire as Augustus from 305 to 306 CE. Upon his death, there was a civil war between the claimants to the throne and Constantine came out on top. In addition to the Western Roman Empire, he also took over the Eastern Roman Empire in 324, hence making himself the emperor of all Roman territories. This was a huge empire that faced many threats. Constantine felt that Rome wasn't the place to rule this empire from. 
Even before him, various cities other than Rome had served as capital of the empire. Constantine chose the site of Byzantium to build his new capital, from which he would rule both the west and the east. It was strategically a very good place due to its location on a peninsula with the sea on three sides. It was easier to defend while having good access to the sea. It was also at the crossroads between Asia, Europe and the Mediterranean Sea. It was also closer to the eastern and northern frontiers of the empire, hence making it easier for him to face any challenges on those fronts. Constantine named the city after Rome, calling it Nova Roma, or New Rome. However, sometime after his death, the city came to be known by his own name, Constantinople. The city took six years to build and was consecrated in 330, at which point it was made the capital of the Roman Empire. This is where the actual history of Constantinople begins. However, the legacy of Byzantium lives on as modern historians refer to the Eastern Roman Empire as Byzantine Empire as well. More on that in a minute. In addition to founding Constantinople, Constantine is famous for having been the first Christian emperor of Rome. In 312, during his fight for the throne, Constantine is said to have had a vision that began his journey towards Christianity. In the year 313, he issued the Edict of Milan, which gave legal status to Christianity and forbade the persecution of Christians. While later Christian sources would claim that he designed Constantinople to be a Christian city through and through, that's not actually true. He built at least two pagan temples in the city, along with the Church of the Holy Apostles and another church where the Hagia Sophia stands today. Both of these were completed after his death. He also brought pagan relics to the city along with Christian ones. It was in the century after Constantine's death that it became a Christian city and began to take shape in the Christian minds almost as a holy city. By the mid-4th century, it seems that most of the city's population was slowly Christianized, the pagan temples fell into disuse and were eventually demolished. In the Second Ecumenical Council of the Christian Church in 381, it was proclaimed that the Bishop of Constantinople would be second only to the Pope in Rome, hence giving the city a high place in the Christian Church. In the next centuries, the great city kept growing. The city had something like 90,000 people when Constantine died in 337, and by the middle of the next century, it ballooned to half a million residents. Later emperors kept expanding the city and adorning it with symbols of imperialism. Both Theodosius I and Theodosius II gave it important landmarks. Theodosius I built, among other things, the form of Theodosius and an arch that later became the Golden Gate. He also brought an ancient Egyptian obelisk and had it installed in the Hippodrome. During the reign of Theodosius II, the formidable walls that Constantinople became famous for were built. These walls, known as the Theodosian Walls, defended the great city for around a thousand years. The walls were built when both the Eastern and Western Roman empires were being threatened by Germanic tribes and the Huns. It's said that Attila the Hun took one look at the walls and turned back. The next great patron of Constantinople was Emperor Justinian. Constantine's original cathedral had burned down in 404 CE and a second one was built by Theodosius II in 415. Justinian, however, built the third one, the Hagia Sophia, as we know it today. This new building was much bigger and grander, with a massive dome on top that seemed to almost float in the air, hanging from the skies, as one writer puts it. Justinian supposedly exclaimed that he had done Solomon, the biblical king himself, when he entered the cathedral. The Hagia Sophia, and by extension Constantinople itself, began to take on a more holy identity, with legends of the time stating that the Hagia Sophia was protected by an angel or the Virgin Mary, the mother of Jesus herself. The Patriarch of Constantinople at one point went as far as to say that the Virgin Mary was commander-in-chief of the city and would protect it against any threats. During Justinian's reign, thanks to his policies and high taxes, there was a riot in the city and much of the city was destroyed in the process. Justinian rebuilt much of the city 
adding and renovating many of the cathedrals and monuments, including the Hagia Sophia, which was burned down during the riots as well. When the Western Roman Empire fell in 476, Constantinople became the undisputed capital of the Roman Empire, or what was left of it, and was hence held up as the greatest city in Christendom. Unfortunately, that painted a target on the city's back. For the next thousand years, everyone wanted to be the one to capture the great city and bring the Eastern Roman Empire to its knees. In 626 CE, at the height of the last Roman-Persian War, while Emperor Heraclius was busy leading an army in Armenia, the Sassanids of Persia joined forces with the Avars in an attempt to take Constantinople. However, due to the Avars' inability to breach the Theodosian walls, coupled with Roman naval dominance blocking Persian reinforcements, the siege ultimately failed. This was the first time that the Theodosian walls were put to test in a proper siege, but it would definitely not be the last. A new force was rising up to the south, which would threaten the Eastern Roman Empire for the next 800 years, chipping away at its territory piece by piece. This force was a religious movement known as Islam. By the year 632, when Prophet Muhammad passed away, much of Arabia was under the control of his successors, known as the Caliphs or Khalifa, Arabic for successor or deputy. The new Islamic empire, known as the Rashidun Caliphate, broke out of Arabia and invaded the greater Middle East, attacking both the Eastern Roman and the Persian Sassanid empires. The Sassanids were completely wiped out, with the surviving royals fleeing to China. The Eastern Roman Empire, however, lost much of its territory, losing all of Syria, Palestine, Egypt, and eventually further west, Libya and Tunisia, with Carthage falling in the 690s. Eastern Roman control over the Mediterranean Sea, known as Our Sea in Latin, was lost as well, once the Rashidun developed a navy. However, the greatest prize for the Muslims was still the city of Caesar, as the Muslims called Constantinople. The first Islamic siege of Constantinople took place during the reign of the Umayyad dynasty, the successors of the Rashidun caliphs. They attempted to take the city possibly three times, first in 669, then from 674 to 678 when they held the city under blockade, and then finally in 717 when a combination of Roman naval might, military assistance by the Bulgars, a mutiny by enslaved Christian sailors, and an unusually cold winter forced the Arabs to retreat. The city and the Eastern Roman Empire had survived nearly a century of onslaught by the Muslims, but Constantinople was a far cry from the glory days under Constantine or Justinian. Fewer than 200,000 people lived within the walls of the city and what was left was filled with overgrown ruins, with many of those ruins being demolished for their building material. On top of that, Latin had fallen out of use, the army was greatly diminished in size, and the infamous iconoclast controversy created a schism that threatened to tear the empire apart. But despite all these existential threats, both internal and external, the city slowly recovered over the next few centuries under the Isaurian and later Macedonian dynasties. But the face of the city would forever be altered. By now, the Eastern Roman Empire was definitely Greek, shifting its culture further from that of the Western Roman Empire that was centered on Rome. In the following centuries, the Eastern Roman Empire shifted into a rather peaceful existence with the Muslim empires to the south, where they fought from time to time, but not much territory changed hands. However, the city's first mosque was built around this time for the many Muslims who traveled to and lived in the city for various reasons, from trade to serving as mercenaries for the Byzantine army. This era of relative prosperity makes it sound as if the dangers posed to Constantinople in the 7th and 8th centuries were a thing of the past, but that couldn't be further from the truth, for the existential threat against the empire, once imposed by the caliphate, were now imposed by other enemies. Firstly, we have the Bulgars, who attempted a siege in 812 and then again in 913, 921, and 923, all of which ended in failure. Secondly, we have the Kievan Rus, who attempted to take the city first in 860, then again in 907, and then for a third and final time in 941. 
the latter of which lasted three years, all of which ultimately ended in failure. Finally, there was the threat of internal rebellions and usurpers, many of which took a swing at Constantinople as well. The city would reach new heights under the reign of the longest reigning emperor in Roman history, Basil II. His nearly 50-year-long reign would allow the empire to attain levels of prosperity not seen since the days of Justinian, which led to the population of Constantinople rising to well over 300,000 people, the establishment of a Rus merchant enclave, and the establishment of one of the most famous military units in Byzantine history, the Varangian Guard. Despite all of this, very few traces of Constantinople from this period remain, However, with the death of Basil II in 1025, the empire once again went into decline. A combination of court politics and lackluster leadership squandered most of the treasury and inflation became so rampant that it effectively destroyed the value of the old currency that had been in use since before Constantine the Great himself. All while theological dispute with the Pope in Rome resulting in a permanent split between the Catholic Church in the West and the Orthodox Church in the East, with the biggest catastrophe of them all being their defeat at the Battle of Manzikert by the Muslim Seljuk Turks, who then immediately seized the opportunity to overrun most of Anatolia within the span of a single decade. The empire would never fully recover from these blows. In 1095, Emperor Alexios sent a letter to the Pope asking for a small contingent of knights to assist him in his planned reconquest of Anatolia. Instead, he received a massive host of what was likely the largest army that had ever set foot in Anatolia since the days of Constantine the Great, the Army of the First Crusade. The arrival of the Italians and the Crusaders to Constantinople created new tensions for people of the city who collectively referred to the new arrivals as the Latins, in reference to the Latin rite of the Catholic faith that all of them shared. However, the tensions between the native Greek-speaking population and the Latins reached a breaking point in 1182 when the 64-year-old Andronicus Comnenus appealed to the people to commit what we would today call a race riot or a pogrom, where nearly the entire Latin population of the city was either killed or enslaved. This reached a second breaking point barely 20 years later during what would later be remembered as the Fourth Crusade, which, to grossly oversimplify, went as follows. The Pope had declared a crusade to take Egypt, ruled at that point by the grandson of the famous Saladin. After a series of misfortunes around the Adriatic, the crusaders are approached by an exiled Byzantine prince and agree to help him in exchange for an obscenely large sum of money. The crusaders easily stormed the city and put their exiled prince on the throne. The new emperor begins emptying the treasury, but quickly realizes that he cannot possibly pay the crusaders the large sum of money within a reasonable span of time. The crusaders grow restless and eventually figured out what was going on and decided to take matters into their own hand, starting the worst sack in the city's history. Although the infamous sack of Constantinople in 1204 lasted only three days, it was unlike any sack in the city's history before or since. Thousands of monuments and precious artifacts were either stolen, demolished, or melted down for their precious materials, while the people of Constantinople were subjected to untold atrocities, which I cannot mention on this channel without getting demonetized. Once the sack ended, the crusaders proclaimed a new empire in the place of the old one, which they referred to as either the Empire of the Romans or the Empire of Constantinople. More commonly, however, it's known in the history books as the Latin Empire, although the Greeks called it Francocratia, meaning rule by Franks, because the court language was French. By this point, Constantinople and Byzantium before it had enjoyed 1,158 years of uninterrupted rule by the Romans without ever falling to a foreign power. It was besieged a couple of times, it even changed hands during civil wars and struggles for power, but it never became part of another empire. That's a very impressive achievement, especially for a city as prized as this one. The following six decades of Latin rule saw a continued decline in the economic power and influence in the region, all while almost constantly fighting a war on all sides against the Bulgarians, the Turkish Beyliks, and remnant Byzantine successor states. One of these successor states was the Empire of Nicaea, 
which in 1261 managed to retake the city. Latin rule in Constantinople had once and for all come to an end with the Emperor of Nicaea entering the city and proclaiming himself the Emperor of a restored Roman Empire, or Byzantine Empire, or whatever. That gives around 57 years to the Latin Empire. The city's population was at that point less than a tenth of what it had been a century earlier, and if you were to take a walk from the Hippodrome to the Theodosian Walls, it would look less like a proper city and more like a collection of small towns separated by large swaths of dilapidated buildings and overgrown ruins with many areas having been cleared to make room for farming. Nevertheless, the city began to grow and many buildings that were built during this period still survive to this day. However, at this point the decline of the empire was unavoidable and the city's population was only kept afloat by the near-constant trickle of refugees fleeing a new rising power in Anatolia, the Ottomans. We already have a video about the family tree of the Ottoman Empire, which gives an overview of its history, so I'm not going to go into much detail here. Suffice it to say, the Ottomans ended up being the single greatest political threat to the Byzantine state for the rest of its remaining existence, and any territorial gains by the Ottomans more often than not came at the expense of the Byzantines. This combined with the arrival of the Black Death, the political mismanagement of Emperor John V Cantacuzenos, and simply bad luck would eventually result in the city of Constantinople being completely surrounded by Ottoman lands by the end of the 14th century CE, even becoming a vassal of the Ottoman Sultan. But a mere vassal was not enough for the ambitious Ottomans. They wanted to rule the city themselves and in order to do that, they had to conquer it. They made their first attempt in 1391, then a second attempt in 1394, and then a third attempt in 1411, and then a fourth attempt in 1422, all ending in failure. But the final and the most famous siege of them all was the siege of 1453, led by the last Roman Emperor, Constantine XI, and the 21-year-old Sultan Mehmed II. This was, in terms of manpower, the largest siege ever since the Fourth Crusade and Mehmed wasn't taking any chances. He assembled an army of over 100,000 men from all across his vast domain and employed the latest weapons that the late medieval world had to offer. To put it simply, the siege ended up being one of the shortest in the city's history, lasting a mere 53 days and ending in an Ottoman victory. The young sultan allowed his army to plunder the city for three days before entering the city himself, proclaiming it his new capital and styling himself with the title Caesare Rom, roughly translating to the Emperor of the Romans. His contemporaries, however, refer to him by the title of Fateh, meaning the conqueror. In the Islamic world, we often refer to him as Muhammad Fateh Constantinia, meaning Muhammad the Conqueror of Constantinople. I don't know of any other city that was such a prize that its conqueror is referred to by its name. This starts a new chapter in the story of Constantinople. While it began its life as a pagan city and was rebuilt as a Christian one, it would once again be reoriented to a Muslim city with its churches being converted into mosques and towering minarets dotting its landscape. The Roman chapter of the city's history lasted uninterrupted for 1,158 years, and then with a Latinization break of 57 years, it continued for another 192 years. That brings the total of the Roman period to a nice round 1,350 years. Spoiler alert, the Ottomans never beat that. The decline of the city that had began with the sack of 1204 had slowed down when the Byzantine Empire was re-established, but the city was still only a shadow of its former self. The Ottomans changed that. Mehmed the Conqueror himself put a lot of time and money into rebuilding the city and making it better than before. The Hagia Sophia was of course converted into a mosque, but many Christian churches were allowed to remain open. However, the city was Islamized as many new mosques, madrasas, and mausoleums with quintessential Islamic features were built. Artisans from all over the Islamic world and even Europe were invited to work there. The city also accepted a large number of Jewish and Muslim refugees who were expelled from Spain by the Catholic monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabella. So over time, the city once again became a multi-religious and multi-ethnic metropolitan city. Perhaps nowhere was this more evident than in the construction of the Grand Bazaar, which was built only two years after the conquest. 
the Grand Bazaar was home to goods and people from all over the world. The Topkapi Palace, which is now a museum, was also built shortly after the conquest by Mehmed the Conqueror to serve as a new capital building of the empire. The main entrance of the palace gave rise to the term sublime port, which basically referred to the central government of the Ottomans, in the same way that the term White House is used to refer to the executive branch of the United States government, as well as the building that the president lives and works in. Mehmed's great-grandson, Suleiman, became the city's next great patron. During his era, an architect named Mimar Sinan built many great architectural projects all over the Ottoman Empire. His masterpiece, however, is considered the Suleimania Mosque in Istanbul. Oh, I forgot to explain the name Istanbul. A common explanation for the name is that Istanbul basically means the city of Islam, but that's not actually true. It actually comes from Greek, and it simply means to the city or just the city, because it was the city in the region. The name Istanbul was actually used during the Ottoman period as well, and it's even found on some coins, but it simply could be a pun on Istanbul, and given that it was the seat of the Islamic Caliph, essentially the head of the Islamic faith, at least the Sunni majority of it, the name could have been used to show its importance as sort of a central city of Islam, in the same way that it had been the central city of Eastern Orthodox Christianity. The name Istanbul and even Islambul were colloquially used for centuries before Istanbul became the official name of the city at the end of the 19th century and was used in the Ottoman Constitution of 1876. So why did the Ottomans change it from Constantinople to Istanbul? I wish I could tell you, but I guess people just liked it better that way. And that's nobody's business but the Turks. The Ottoman period lasted for 469 years. That's two centuries short of even half of the Roman period. However, it was much more stable than the Roman period had been. Civil wars were arguably less common with the Ottomans than they had been with the Romans. This was partly due to the Ottoman tradition of fratricide, when a prince who succeeded his father would kill his brothers and other male members of the family to secure power for himself. Whatever the case, the Ottoman Empire came crumbling down when it picked the wrong side of the First World War. The Allies tried to capture Constantinople during the famous Gallipoli campaign, but were pushed back. However, when the war ended, Constantinople was occupied by the Allies for around five years before the former territories of the Ottoman Empire in Anatolia were secularized as the Republic of Turkey, with the city of Ankara, not Istanbul, as its capital. The Hagia Sophia, with its rich history, became a museum, which it remained until 2020. Also in that year, the most famous of Istanbul's residents passed away. She was named Glee and for 16 years, she welcomed tourists to the great Hagia Sophia, an everlasting symbol of the incredible history of this great city. So at the end, to answer the question, it was the Romans that ruled Constantinople the longest at 1350 years. They're followed by the Greek era at 679 years, and then the Ottomans at 469 years, which they shared with the feral cats of Istanbul. By the way, we don't actually know why Istanbul has so many feral cats. The most common theory is that during the Ottoman period, cats were quite common because they were used to keep mice at bay, and since Muslims really like cats because Prophet Muhammad showed a lot of love for them, they were just fed and given shelter in mosques, so they decided to stick around. Anyhow, thank you for watching.